So the story takes place in New York City in 1943, so historical. And Jenny Ryan is trying to get to a man named Marcus Forrester, uh, who is a wealthy industrialist with uh, questionable uh, allegiances, um, because she thinks that he had something to do with her father's death. And that leads her to an exclusive Manhattan nightclub, and she's immediately distracted by the sultry singer, singer on stage, who is our other main character, Catherine Hammond. Um, and in short order, she sees that the singer is Forrester's mistress. So her brilliant idea is to get to him through her. And so they do a little flirting. Uh, and so uh, in this scene, they're having a drink together at the nightclub and things get a little testy because Jenny has a big mouth and no filter. Oh. So. <laughs> so they were they were having so I was wondering what they were doing before this. So they were yeah. sitting and having a drink and just like Yeah, they, they sort of had a, a little flirty scene in the ladies' room uh before that involved uh stockings with seams and uh straightening seams and things like that. And uh where Catherine sort of said, Well sure, you know. You know, it didn't take her long to figure out what was she saying, what her angle was, you know, oh, so you're trying to use me to get to him. Well, you know what, why don't I just introduce you to? And she's like, oh, well, you know, that would be awesome. But by the time they leave, he's, he's gone. So, so, but Jenny still wants to sort of get in with Catherine so that, you know, she can still get that interview that she promised her. So um, that's where we are. Perfect. Well, all right. Go away. Yeah, I was couldn't decide whether I wanted to read it off my computer or the book. So I'm going to try the computer and luck to us all. <laughs> Jenny cleared her throat into the uncomfortable silence and feared she had annoyed the woman after all. Anyway, if I can get that interview, she looked up in time to see Catherine raise her brow even further. She noticed she didn't voice an outright refusal, so Jenny pushed on. Why are you helping me? Oh, I don't know, Catherine said. I just thought you might need a little help. It's obvious you're not very good at this, flying in here on a wing in a prayer, hoping to topple the mighty Mark Forrester with your lethal pencil and notebook. Jenny stared at her. The casual use of Forrester's name and Catherine's condescending attitude stung. She felt like a teenager again, awkward and unsophisticated, and wholly unprepared for her task. She supposed she deserved the attitude after insinuating that Catherine was a whore, but it hurt nonetheless. I don't need your pity, Miss Hammond, Catherine smiled. You may not need my pity, Miss Ryan, but you obviously need my help or you wouldn't be here. What do you think you're going to get from that interview? A confession? If I'm lucky, at the very least, I'm going to prove he's in cahoots with Nazi sympathizers in this country. Catherine chuckled. A Nazi sympathizer too. Good heavens. He's not stupid, Miss Ryan. You think he's just going to come out and incriminate himself? I notice you're not denying that it's true. Now, why do you think I would know anything about that? And if I did, why would I care or tell you about it? You're kidding, right? Jenny can hardly contain her indig ind indignation. That bastard is supporting the war machine that's killing our boys over there. Or don't you care about that? It'll take more than an interview to prove that, Catherine said, and then took a drink. Jenny glared at her. I think you know something. Catherine put her glass down and stared back blankly. Jenny was dumbfounded. Making poor personal choices was one thing, but shirking your patriotic duty was inexcusable. How can you just sit there and not even try to do something about this, or at least, at least help me do something about it? Catherine leaned back in her chair, crossed her arms. I do what I can. I did say I'd get you that interview. The damn interview was losing ground fast to Jenny's temper. You're despicable, Catherine chuckled. Really? Yes, really. The whole world is falling apart. And people like you try to skate through the debris like you're not part of it, like it doesn't affect you. Well, I've got news for you, sister. You enjoy the freedoms of this country, and when she's in trouble, it's up to every one of us to come to her aid and do anything and everything we can to preserve what so many have sacrificed and died for. Rah, rah, rah said Catherine. I bet you've got little American flags sewn into your panties. Fuck off. Oh, Catherine drew out. A sailor at heart. Lovely. She reached out and picked up her cigarette with long, nimble fingers, and then lit it with her slim silver lighter. The motion was exquisitely feminine and equally seductive. As was the tilt of her head when the cigarette met the lighter, 
the pursing of her lips as she slowly inhaled, and the narrowing of her eyes as they reflectively protected themselves from the flame. Jenny hated her for it, for making her furious and aroused all at the same time. Her arousal was short-lived, however, as a veil of white smoke clouded her vision and assailed her nostrils on Catherine's exhale. The curtain of smoke slowly dissolved, and cold blue eyes stared back at her. Gone was the sparkle and warmth of the moments before. Jenny could hardly believe it was the same woman. It was disconcerting and instilled a strange sense of panic. The evening was spiraling down quickly, and Jenny was desperate to come away with something. People of Forrester's ilk understood threats, so she settled on that, determined to get her money's, her money's worth before some burly guard dog escorted her out. I've already got proof, she lied. I'm just going to give him the opportunity to defend himself before I hang him with it. Catherine bowed her head, taking a doubting chuckle with her. The laughter made Jenny's blood boil. This was her chance to not only move up at the paper, but to impact world events. And this woman, who had no interest in anything but herself, was standing in her way, laughing at her. Look, Jenny said, I can't be a soldier on the front line, but at least, Catherine snapped her head up, the icy glare back. Dying on the front line is nothing to aspire to. But at least I'm trying to make a difference, Jenny continued, ignoring the interruption. Unlike you, the only thing you're trying to make is room under your next meal ticket. Catherine smirked, unfazed by the insult. Ouch. Jenny had had enough. She pushed her chair from the table, grabbed her purse, and headed toward the exit. Hey, what about that interview? Catherine called after her. I think we have some rope in the back. An obscene hand gesture over the shoulder was Jenny's answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. These ladies, goodness gracious, God, yeah. all. Um, all right, so first question, why did you pick this scene to read? Um, I, a lot goes on in this book and it was really hard to pick a scene that would encompass, you know, sort of the gist of it all, but I felt this one did because it showed you Jenny's personality, which is sort of impetuous and, you know, she's, she's not helping herself, honestly, which is a theme with her. And uh, it showed Catherine as well, just unfazed by, you know, anything. And at this point, you don't know who she is, what her agenda is, um, but it still gives a pretty good indication of, you know, her personality. Uh, so that's why I chose that scene. Okay. I really like it that it's not, uh, so you get so many books where there's going to be a romance between the two main characters. And, and I just got, I just finished up the show Heartstopper on Netflix. And it's like a definition of a cute meet. Like the two main characters are going to get together and there's going to be sparks. And, but this is a great example of kind of the opposite where they meet, there's an attraction, but by golly, they're not going to let each other know. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of a of a you know a, a tussle beforehand um i really like that a lot yeah it's definitely a great way to build tension and further characterization um but okay so the the first thing i noticed from this is the pacing the shift like we start out it's very you know dialogue heavy heavy dialogue back and forth very quick and then, you know, Catherine lights her cigarette and there's just this stop. And, you know, it's kind of Jenny's gathering her thoughts and she's like pissed that she's aroused and, um, but also still angry. So I don't know, I got a lot of Catherine from that whole kind of scene. And she seemed to change like, and I think even uh, Jenny said, this seems like a different woman looking back at me. And just her dialogue at the, like at the, after lighting the cigarette, it was just, it's, she seemed, I don't wanna say resigned, but I don't know, just, just different. Do you wanna talk about well, there, there's two parts. There's two parts to the pacing where the, the thing that in the first part, you know, Catherine, you know, sits back, lights a cigarette. It's just letting this girl hang herself. I mean, she's just <laughs> and um, because, like I said, you don't know Catherine's agenda, but um, she she's 
uh, this this happens early. It's in the first chapter, so I'm, I'm not like giving anything away. But she is um, trying to she she works for the OSS, which is the Office of Strategic Services, which was uh, the precursor to the CIA during World War II. And uh, she is a singer, but she's also you know she has a job. So while she's Forrester's mistress, she's his mistress because they're investigating him, and so she is working on that and in the meantime you know Jenny strolls into this and she's going to start messing with her you know assignment she so she needs to get this girl off this guy um so she she's kind of at dual purposes here and so when they're having this back and forth nammer 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 uh, you know Jenny's just getting more upset and you know she realizes that look I'm not getting anywhere with this so we're, I'm just going to all right, let's just let's just reel this back and uh, and try and reset. You know what's going to happen. But then when Jenny starts talking about, you know, the war and fighting on the front lines and stuff, you know, when Catherine is all of a sudden like, you know, because at this point she seems by unfazed by anything. Like, yeah, come on, throw it at me. You know, no worries. But when she says that, it was almost like a. You know, so you get a sense of, okay, there's something, she comes across as unpatriotic in, in earlier scenes, but as soon as Jenny says something like that, she's like, you know, right on it. She's like, look, <laughs> almost as if to say, war is not what you think it is. You here on the home front, a woman not having to be on the front lines or anything like that. So it, you know, it immediately sort of clues the audience in like, oh, you know, she's not as unflappable as she appears. So there, there's something, you know, under the surface there um, that, you know, unspools as the as the story goes on. So, so yeah, so the pacing just um, it's just what the scene called for. And also, you know, like I said, injecting clues about the characters. Um, did you do that? Because Jenny is like super flustered and just totally a mess and annoying to me, in my opinion. Um, and Catherine just kind of like, I feel like she just lit her cigarette to like gather herself, like before she, like, I don't know. You know, it, it's kind of, um, it's kind of one of those things where you can't believe this is happening so you're you're just gonna sit back and, and watch this um like, like she looks down because i mean she, she's like she's like this kid comes in here and she wants something from me and here she is giving me crap about you know i'm so and so's mistress and i'm a whore and you know all this kind of crap. it's like really and this is your approach so she just gotta sit back like what's this kid doing but I of course like she can't she can't just like you know disregard her because she's now she's got to be involved with her as well so <laughs> I feel like she, I got the feeling that on top of all that that was definitely happening I got the feeling that she I don't know like she wanted to help Jenny but it would be weird for her to do that so well, she she has some sympathy for her because she knows her history. She knows, you know, why she's here because she's trying to find out who killed her father. So she she does have some sympathy for her, which is um, shown in the scene before uh, that they share. Um, so, I mean, she she does have a certain affinity for her, and obviously doesn't want to add to her, you know, troubles. <laughs> but but so honestly. <laughs> So when you say that the scene called for the slowdown, why do you think that is? Like, what, what's the purpose of slowing down like that? Just to give everything room to breathe. Everything is snap, 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 snap. Yep, yep, yep. It's like watching old 1940s movies. Like, if you, if you ever watched His Girl Friday with Cary Grant and um, Rosalind Russell, oh my God, the dialogue in that, it's like, boop, 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 joke, 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 boop, 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 boop. and at some point in the movie, even Rosalind Russell's character, they're eating back and forth and she just stops arguing. She's just, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, yes, exactly like that. And so it's going pretty fast and you just, you just need all that, you need to give it room to breathe. And um, so, and that's just how it came out. Like when I was writing it, 
I was like, whew, okay. Well, unless everybody just, let's just take a minute. And um, of course, Catherine's taking a minute and Jenny's just spinning up further and it's just making her matter and matter. And so, you know, and so even after you, you know, you're given the opportunity to just take a minute and think about what you're doing and, you know, if you're helping yourself or not. And it, it just shows that, you know, Jenny just, she honestly doesn't think things through sometimes. And um, so it just lends to her character that that did not stop her in the least. She doubled and tripled down <laughs> on the whole thing and wound up walking out on her, on her one chance to get what she wanted. So yeah, she was really mad at her. She was. <laughs> Woo! So the pacing for you, it was more, it helped, uh, cause you can use pacing for different things. Um, so in that sense, it was just, let's get, let's pause, let's get the reader to kind of soak in everything. Let's get the characters to soak in everything and see it kind of, it creates a shift, you know, and kind of everything. So it's just good to think about, I think. And I think that was a wonderful place to have a pause. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that I'm clever and I and I do that intentionally, but honestly, it, it's just how it comes out in the writing and it turns out instinctually to be the right, you know, thing for the characters in the scene. If, you know, after the first draft and you read over, you know, when you're writing it, it's to, you know, everything's just like do, 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 do. And then like months later, you know, you can go back and read it and you're like, well, well why did I, why did I stop that? Cause that was going pretty good. Uh, and then you change it. But for the, for that scene, it just, it just worked. It served everything that I needed. So. Yeah. And often, you know, those intuitive changes, I mean, they do a lot more for the reader than we might think. So what seem to be like little things, of course I read into everything. So I may be uh, a freak, but I feel like even in a subconscious way, certain things affect the reader that the reader's not even aware of, that the writer might not even be aware of, but the writer's subconscious or intuition kind of just got it right on the money. You know, I just, I love when that happens. So well, that's the thing with um, story structure as well, because I mean, it should be invisible. You, you, sh you shouldn't know exactly why you loved that story. You just did. And, and when you look at it, it's, oh, it's because you use, you know, the, the typical structure that the brain likes, you know, to do. And now at some point, say you're a romance reader, you know, it's like, okay, meet cute, 20%, they get together, 40%, da, 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 80%, dark night of soul, da, 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 grand gesture, happy ending. You know, <laughs> if it's not done well, that's what you think to yourself, um, but, um, but you still enjoy it. Uh, so, and, and I don't know whether that's like a reader thing or an author thing, because like, when I learned story structure and conventions of the genre and all that kind of stuff, I started seeing it in everything. I can't watch a TV show without being exciting incident, midpoint. Da, da, da. <laughs> it's as old as the hills. I mean, so I think it's, oh, just it is. Human, yeah. it's just a human brain thing. You know, we like this to, to go to there, to go there, to go to there, because it, it's just how we think. We it, right. It's like having a mystery. It's like, I need to solve that. <laughs> yeah. It holds our attention too. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. if you if you if you hold off that cute meat or the, the meat for like ten chapters, the 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 readers gonna be like, where are we going with this? Or uh, yeah. even afterwards, I mean, you're like, what's happening? I'm bored. I've started novels and I'm like, oh wait a minute, I thought the people I've been reading about for the first three chapters were the, oh so the, oh okay, <laughs> and then you're like, no, where to start? the story you know sure. there is a backstory and a history of everything but know when to actually start um so yeah and i'm all for playing with the formula like you, you every author and creator should feel free to to make the story their own but mm -hmm. also be aware that these formulas do i mean i say formula but the, these patterns but, do exist for a reason for a reason yeah 
Uh, my first question is that, you know, an easy one, of course. Uh, so I always ask all, all authors, like, are you a plotter or, or a pantser? Um, like, and I pantser! Imagine, I imagine, and we talked about that earlier, pantser, like, but I imagine, like, you're, you're writing in a period that is 80 years old. So you talk a little bit about um, the research to, to achieve some level of historical accuracy. Uh, how does that research translate into your preferred plotting method? Well, uh, I, I don't know whether it was so much a preferred plotting method. Uh, rather, I did not know there was such a thing as a plotting method. <laughs> it just started, you know, I just started writing and um, yeah, I don't, think I would pants another book um, because I'm someone who's paralyzed by like a blank page. So I sort of need points to go to and then it sort of frees me to get there any way that I want, but I need to know where I'm going. And it's like analysis paralysis. You know, I'm just like, I don't know what I want to say. I don't know what the lesson's going to be in this story. So I'm not even going to start it because I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's that's wrong headed. So I, I think that um, having at least an outline uh, is useful. And when it comes to historical fiction, I mean, good grief, you know, you have to have timelines. And, you know, if you have any hope of any accuracy in your historic fiction, which I think any historical fiction author should, you need to know that, oh, well, that subway line, that subway line was discontinued in, you know, 1940. So don't put it in your book in 1943 in New York. And I thought, I mean, when I first started writing the book, it was just a big city, but it became obvious that it was New York City. And I'm like, okay, well, listen, you know, okay, I'll just make it New York City. And then I was like, what a dumbass, because it's the most well-known city in the world. Even if it was 80 years ago, there are people who know stuff. And um, yeah, so that, I involved a lot of research. Um, and sometimes when you're just, uh, no matter how much you search, you just can't find the answers. Um, and so, you know, you're just a little vague and you hope that, you know, you don't have to say what subway she took and how long it took to get, you know, whatever, she just was there. Uh, so, um, so yeah, historical fiction is hard and I probably would not pants it then. I'm definitely a fan of outlining now. <laughs> it's interesting you, you spoke a little bit about, um... The, the 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 lesson of the story coming in. Uh, sometimes I don't think that uh, you. Some authors will even with it with an outline, they'll write the story, and and the messaging kind of organically arises out of it. Like they mm -hmm. they a lot of authors don't go in saying I'm going to write an allegory for you know the Cold War, so to speak, or, or mm -hmm. like, yeah. they, they might, here's the, here's the story that's interesting to me. Um, and then as it's, as it's being fleshed out from an outline or just from your imagination, like the, the, the themes, the messages kind of mm -hmm. organically arise and, and they can, you know, lean into them and further address, but, uh, yeah. I think that whole process to be fascinating too. I was a huge fan of the 1940s, like growing up, I've just loved the, the music and the, the movies and everything. And I was like, oh, so just a natural to write a story in my, my favorite era. And the more research I did, the more horrific it all became. And, you know, between the war and the misogyny and, um, oh my goodness, and the racism and the, you know, just everything. And I was just like, oh, food rationing, um, you know, everything. Uh, it, it, rose, rose glasses crushed at the feet. Um, I mean, I still enjoy the era, but I look at it differently now. And I, and I actually understand the movies better because of the era that they were produced and what they were produced for morale um, and just an escape from the horribleness of everything. Uh, so yeah, huge appreciation now for the era. You should put Joan Crawford in one of your movies like she's on TV like Mildred Pierce is on or something. <laughs> I would be uh, forever. Uh, I love John Crawford. She was big in the 40s. So I love, her in the, I love her in the women. She was great. Oh yeah. She was great. Just yep. all around, <laughs> even when she was crazy. Um yeah, no. 
I was gonna say earlier, when I when I published my novel, I remembered, oh my God, they're drinking soda from like a glass bottle, like Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. That even fucking exist at that time. And I like, cause I'm a pretty crazy researcher. Like I get lost in the research tunnels, you know, spirals or whatever. Like I was reading about the history of toilets for like two days. Rabbit hole. I didn't need any of it, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like totally freaked out and had to look and, and make sure, yes, Coca-Cola was big in 1924, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, research is huge for historical fiction. And if you get it wrong, the audience is merciless. I mean. Especially the ones who <laughs> love those, like those areas. Mm-hmm. Because you get people like us that love certain eras. And if your story is wrong in something, you will get definitely massacred. Yep. Yep. I wanted to bring up queerness and patriotism uh, because your story brings it up. I thought it was something interesting to touch on. Um, I feel like a lot of queer people, unfortunately, and especially back then, were, you know, demonized and dehumanized. It's just interesting to me how the queer community can be very patriotic, despite, you know, their country not being as fair to them. And it's the same with any, with all of the minorities, I would assume that there's this, this inherent love for your country wanting to help, wanting to be part of everything, even though your country at times may not want to be part of you, you know, or your community, your smaller community. So did you, um, like, why did you have Jenny so patriotic? Why did you bring that up? And she's like passionate about it. She is. Um, That goes back to sort of the my inspiration for the story um, started um, on 9-11. There was a photograph in the newspaper of a street in Staten Island. And it was just your typical, you know, row of houses, you know, tree-lined street. Every single house had an American flag hanging from it. And I was like, wow, like, I haven't seen that sort of nationalist you know, unity um, in a long time. You know, Fourth of July, a few people put it out. You know, you know, people perennial flag. You know, put her outers. Uh, you know, my my uh, grandfather was one of them. He put out the flag every day. Um, but you know, that fell off for us. And we put it out on Fourth of July. But you know, that day, like, there were American flags everywhere. And so it just. You know, since you know, I always think of my favorite era, I was like, you know, probably not that unified um, since, you know, World War II times. Um, and, you know, honestly, I don't know that, that we were that unified then either. Uh, but it, the sort of the haze of history paints us as, you know, this unified nation. But I mean, honestly, we were pretty isolationist until um, Pearl Harbor. So um, I imagine there was, you know, that same you know, it's over there, you know, we don't need to be involved in that. But anyway, it just made me think of this patriotic girl, like unabashedly patriotic in that 1940s, my country does no wrong, you know, kind of way. Um, And so that was the beginning of that character. And that's just who she is, just patriotic. She wants to do big things. um, And this war comes along. And she sees her chance. It's like, oh man, you know, I, I really want to get into this. And like, you know, she can't be a soldier, but you know, she can do many things. So she she does all the patriotic things and you know, donates say, you know, socks, knitted socks and things to the Red Cross and donates her time and, and just does what she can. And like this is her opportunity to really affect big things. Uh, and here's this guy who maybe murdered murdered her father and he might be a secret Nazi and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I'm going to bring that guy down because 
Yeah. So well, I think that's great. Just like a nice touch. Um, because some people just feel like they're the ones who are patriotic and they're more patriotic than other Americans, you know? And it's just kind of like, I like how yours touches on that without saying anything about it. I mean, I haven't read the rest of it, but yeah. having that as a an aspect of her character, I think is just a nice touch, especially with, you know, gays being in the military and just the struggles that the community went through um, to be seen as patriotic and, you know, uh, part of the country, I guess. I mean, it's an interesting question about, you know, um, homosexuals, you know, being patriotic when their country is like, you know, um, because I don't agree with everything my country does, but, you know, I'm patriotic and if I can help her do better, fight the good fight, you know, hope springs eternal that, you know, if, if I do my bit, you know, people are going to see that, look, I'm just like you. And, uh, but, you know, whether that's voting or, you know, serving the military, I mean, I'm an army brat, so, um, I mean, I know all about the military. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to sit back and be a petulant citizen because my country's, you know, attitudes, you know, about whatever. And especially during, you know, world, uh, like a war like World War II, um, you know, you want to you want to help win the war, you know, for the people you love, for your way of life, for the uh, for the people who are being oppressed overseas or whatever. It, I, I don't think it matters whether you're you're gay or not. You're a human and you want to help. You want to you want to do better. and you know, honestly, how your country feels about you is irrelevant. Yeah, I feel like there can be that dichotomy that even though, you know, it, the country, our country may not be fair to us always, um, we can want it to be different and we can be angry at something that's happening in our country and want change of some sort and still love our country dearly at the same time. So that always just pissed me off um, to think that, oh, because we're protesting about this one thing that obviously we don't care about our country and we're not actually worth listening to, you know? Um, so that always kind of gets my goat. So I thank you and applaud you for having that in there. Nice little touch. I would, I might not have thought of it, at least not for my story. It doesn't. Uh... Well, the, the time was different as well. There, there wasn't a world war going on. So mm -hmm. it, it wasn't everywhere. It wasn't affecting, you know, regular life or whatever so it would it would have been out of place almost uh, there's no no reason for it in your book the characters more so embody aspects of america rather than just outright i love america blah 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 so i like that your character has that mm -hmm. um, and being a queer novel you know i just i love that so well, you know honestly when i wrote it i didn't i didn't write it as this is what happened to gay people during this period. Mm -hmm. I wrote a novel and the characters just happened to be gay. It wasn't like nothing in the story happens because they're gay. Uh, I don't think, no. <laughs> um, it, everything was just a storyline and they just happened to be gay. It, it wasn't because of that. And I just wanted like, just have a book where gay people are just normal people. Things happen to them not because they're gay, but just the things. <laughs> this is actually kind of a theme in the authors that I've been talking to in their books, where the characters are gay and, and things are gay, but it's not like a thing, you know? It's not a huge, crazy deal like it is in real life sometimes. Uh, there's no dis discrimination, blah, blah, blah. Um, like the book, you know, the stories themselves are not about like the fight for being gay. Mm -hmm or queer or whatever. Um, and those books have their place, but that wasn't the book exactly. that I wanted to. I, I wanna read about people like me and- um, Just yeah. living our lives. Just, just, just living. <laughs> and we happen to be queer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just because we're queer does not mean that that is what defines us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think kind of like we were alluding to earlier, where it's like these characters, same thing for these characters, like this is a part of who they are, but it does not define them. So they are able to be patriotic at the same time. I mean, they have their own you know, identities, uh, pursuits, um, things that have influenced them in the past. Uh, so this is just an, an aspect of who they are, just like we as real people. And uh, maybe you touch, this, touch on this in your novel too, but same thing with the United States. It's like the United States is not defined by or should not be defined by a single group of people. Um, it, it, and there may be, you know, certain group, you know, groups are larger or lean towards one way at a given period of time, but uh, it is not defined by one thing. Uh, the United States as a nation where we, we, we do have more uh, in the pot, so to speak. And, and we have our own history that we're not proud of. I mean, going back to World War II where we treated uh, Japanese Americans, you know, post uh, Pearl Harbor horrifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't really go into that uh, a whole lot. We tend to like to sweep that to the side. Um, but again, we as a nation have treated queer people horribly over uh, decades, you know, hundreds of years and, and, and other groups of people as well. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, I, even, I like, go ahead. I was gonna say, but even so it's like, there are still stories during that time when gays or anyone were treated poorly that there are still stories where the people are just living their lives and they happen to be gay or, you know. So I love that this has been kind of a theme among the, the people that I've gotten to know in the community. Um, it's like, yeah, these characters are queer and they're not getting chased because of it. You know, they're not getting burned, they're wh whatever. So I think it's, it's gotta be progress to some degree, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like, if we're writing the queer novel, that's not to argue that queerdom is okay. We're just telling a story. It's about- yeah. I mean, just normalize it because it's no. that's how it, it should is. be. Yeah, yeah. The 1940s, uh, World War II era period has seen has seen a lot in fiction. Um, Man in the High Castle book was very good. Uh, the TV show was good too. Uh, I think of even in sci-fi. Uh, I'm a big Star Trek fan, and in multiple of the series, there's a lot of exploration into World War II. I tend to think of. Voyager, there's a, a couple of uh, episodes where they're- in I the love world. that, I love that episode, it was a two-parter. Uh, yes, it was, Seven <laughs> of Nine is, the, the, when I was reading your, your passage, initially I'm like, this reminds me of Seven of Nine singing in the night. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> um, and she was smoking hot. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Um, but also we have like uh, Westworld is a, a TV show that's on now, doing the same type of thing where they explore these particular periods of time. What do you think draws us as both creators and consumers of, uh, of uh, these art forms to such a devastating time period? And maybe you spoke to it a little bit earlier. Um, is it, and I tend to think of it, maybe it's, it's the backdrop of that time period that makes like a really good tapestry for telling stories or is there, is there something else that you think that draws us to it? Um. You know, there's so many stories to tell um, during the World War II era. I mean, stories of incredible courage as well as incredible cowardice and shame. And I mean, war creates such a, a sense of urgency um, about everything when it comes to relationships. I mean, no one's promised tomorrow. I mean, you're not anyway, but you know, it's like in your face, you know, <laughs> when there's a war and, um, sure. And when we now look back, it, it almost feels like, oh, things were just simpler then. There were good guys and there were bad guys. And like, it's like if aliens invaded the earth, we could all band together and fight the other, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I really can't explain why I'm drawn to it other than aesthetically. Uh, I just, you know, I like 
the hair, the profiles, uh, the clothes. Um, yeah, it is very sexy. Yeah, very, I just I always think of like sultriness and noir film, and you know. Yeah. I was like, the covers of your books again those are just perfect I, I love the covers they're just the, Thank the you. clothes the the, the, the looks atmosphere yeah, it's just, yeah. well the, the covers are really hard because uh, my first mistake was actually putting faces on the covers because then it, it's a four-part series now I'm locked into those models right <laughs> so so I have to I have to fortunately one of the models has like a ton of uh, poses and, and things, but the other one does not. A very, very limited uh, view of the blonde. And so it's been hard. And of course, none of them are in period clothing because why would they be, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the one dress on the second book cover, the black one, that was, I didn't have to do anything to it. I'm like, okay, that'll work. Um, you know, and so, and, and in fact, the one who's the dark haired, the dark haired model, she's actually blonde. So in all the pictures that I get from her, I have to, you know, change her hair color and give her give her a uh, period appropriate hair, which I wind up drawing, and I have to, you know, fudge the clothing and you know and all that. So it's tough. <laughs> I mean, there there are um, some sources uh, that do historical fiction, but I mean they're just super expensive. And then you know I just okay, I don't have the money for that, so I'm just gonna have to wing it. So yeah, but it is, it's interesting because as complicated as the hair and the clothing were with all the little dudes and bobs and all this kind of stuff, it, it's, it's actually very streamlined. Um, so there's like this dichotomy of it. It's complicated, but it's streamlined. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I just uh, always been drawn to it. When we think of the forties and you know, that period of time, you know, spies and reporters and nightclub singers, we tend to have um, archetypes built around them, uh, it's at least for voices and mannerisms. And even in that scene, you know, you had the, the cigarette and lighting a cigarette and blowing the smoke. And a lot of that stuff, you just seem to associate with this period of time. Um, when writing the dialogue, did you have any specific voices for these characters? Like even if it's in your head or, or are you imagining, did you pull from anything? I, I did. I mean, for the atmosphere, I, I pulled from a lifetime of, you know, loving the 40s movies and like, just watching everything I could. Um, so, so I had the atmosphere, but as far as like, who do I see? What voice do I hear when I'm writing these? Um, you know, th this started as uh, a fanfic. Well, I was writing fanfic at the time, um, and it was Xena fanfic at the time. And so while I moved on from the fanfic and started writing my own, you know, story, I still had that like in my head. So like Kat is Lucy <laughs> and Jenny is Renee. So th those are the, that's who I have in my head when, when I'm writing it and voicing it. And as far and like some of the vocal mannerisms are from like the forties. And obviously the dialogue, you know, it's like, say, listen, what gives, you know, I mean, 40s. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that's who's in my head. Zena. Yep. That's a fun show. Yep. I have a hard time like, all right, now I need to take this voice and make it you're going from <laughs> a fantasy to historical. It yeah, I yeah, have a hard time yeah. writing that dialogue like, yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's funny because I had, um, if I were to pick actresses from that time, I would think of Kat as Lauren Bacall from To Have and Have Not. Um, very sort of cool and sultry and yeah. And uh, then Jenny would be a little more frenetic, like uh, Rosalind Russell from His Girl Friday, just like that pushy, you know, reporter, just, you know, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> kind of a bulldog of, you know, just barreling her way through. So my question, this scene, uh, or this passage, it made me think that, you know, challenges cannot phase the truth, but lies cannot handle even the slightest challenge. It was just funny to me because I felt like there was more truth to Catherine who, was seemingly, you know, the, you know, tough nut to crack, 
secrets, mistress, you know, she might be a whore. Um, she's in cahoots with this bad guy. And she just seemed to uh, exude more of the truth to me than what Jenny was doing. Like, she seemed totally like... Well, I mean, for Catherine, she for Catherine she's an agent so lying is old hat and she does it easily I mean she probably lies more than she tells the truth which takes a toll on a person as we'll see um as the story goes on but I mean lies are a house of cards one misstep and they all fall down which cranks up the you know the tension um and if you're going to write a novel that contains espionage you're going to have secrets and lies so and Jenny's having a hard time because she lives in that sort of that naive truth world um, but at this point, she's def desperate enough to lie to get what she wants. And she's also going to learn more about secrets and lies as well. So, I mean, they're, they're almost going on a path like this. Um, Catherine's going to learn more about being honest and telling the truth. And Jenny's going to learn more about, you know, you got to do what you got to do to get what you want. So, and, and it, it just turned out to be the arc of each character. Um, you know, you want them to start here and wind up there, and, and so and their arcs definitely, um, you know, over the entire series, just ooh, they almost they almost switch places, which makes it super interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, considering <laughs> considering where they started, um, like if you picked up the last book, they'd both be probably a little unrecognizable. But it's just a natural progression as you read through the series. So. Interesting, very um, interesting. I see that you know, Shadow of the Past is available on audiobook uh, as a narrator myself, I'm curious about the process you underwent to get that produced. Um, and is the other plans for the next book? Yes, there are plans for the next book. Um, it is on the docket to be recorded right now. So, <clears throat> so yay for that. Um, and it was an interesting process because um, typically you would go through, I mean, there's different ways to go through it. I went through ACX, but there's find away voices now and oh, there's something else, but I can't remember what it's called. I went through ACX. Um, usually you would put up a script, you know, so maybe you would have, you know, different characters you want someone to, you know, um, uh, read for and um, then you would settle on that person and then you you know all that kind of stuff in my case I knew the narrator that I wanted um, and so I just contacted her directly um, that's Abby Creighton and um, and I was surprised because I was like okay I'm not sure how to go about this and she's a pretty big deal so you know, I just, I looked her up and like, she had a website and, you know, it had her representation and I was like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and then underneath that, it was just like, and oh, by the way, here's my email. And I'm like, mm, okay, well, let's give that a shot. So I, I just emailed her and I said, I have this series and um, I'm interested in having a narrator and that narr narrated and I'd like you to do that. And I'm not, I'm pretty sure this is not how I'm supposed to do this, but just let me know the process. And well, she's like, yep, this is cool. And I was like, oh, sweet. <laughs> so that's um, awesome yeah so that's how that worked and yeah Why did you have her in mind i had listened to a lot of narrators and there's just something about her voice just the, the timbre of her voice it's just very calming to me <laughs> and you know and and i listen to it and sometimes i'm listening to a narrator and i'm just like oh, i don't think i can do a whole book of this um and uh, yeah, so I listened to a lot of them and I just keep, you know, I kept coming back to her and I was like, I just, I just love her voice. I wonder if she'll do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so she did. That's awesome. So you just, I mean, the worst that could have happened was you never heard from her. You know? Yeah, she says no, no. or yeah. how, dare, how dare you email me? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> she's like, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, go through the go through representation. That's why it's on the website. Um, so but, I, no, she was lovely. I saw on Twitter that uh, your audiobook is number one in lesbian historical fiction. I know, right? Oh, how's that? <laughs> well, it was weird because you know I see people like putting up their their stats. It's like, oh, look where my audiobook is, and I'm like, how do you even find that? 
because you know I'm looking <laughs> around and I'm going on audible and I'm like how do you where the that's I don't get it and then I was just like you know checking Amazon you know how are the reviews going <laughs> and uh so I, cl I clicked on on the audio on the audio book and where it has the categories and stuff it said number three in be um, best-selling lbgtq plus historical fiction I went what and so I clicked on that and it's like yeah sure enough I was like you know power of the dog is over here another book is over there and, ah, I think there's one. um and amazing then, and then underneath that they had two two little you know picture squares and my my book was in there too and so it was number one on new releases and number two in most wished for uh and I was like what screenshot that sucker uh, <laughs> market <laughs> So, congratulations that's awesome that, that was thrilling and, and it's been the number one release for for quite quite a few days now so you Very know normally nice. i had a book pub on my book once and it went up to like it was a bestseller in canada for a hot second but that's you know that's because it's 99 cents but this was like legit you know and, and i wasn't even paying attention so I, awesome. I don't know what it was before that but yeah so that was uh, how long ha how long has your audio book been up uh it came out on may 5th okay so yeah not even a month awesome i know for you I'm so happy Exciting. yeah yeah awesome probably just build from here i would assume yeah i hope so i mean i've had people you know the reviews are good and um some people have said yeah so i'm gonna buy the next audio book but i can't wait so i'm gonna buy your book now so I can find out what happened. <laughs> uh -huh. like, That's sweet. Thank you. There are a few yeah. series that I only listen to, but then they'll stop doing the audiobooks for whatever reason. And it's like, but I, uh, I don't want to read. I want to listen to it. You know, it's always yeah. a bummer. It's kind of like what I asked. Like, you got this one done. Are there plans to do the next ones? Because um, it's always oh, always a shame, though, for whatever reason. Maybe it could be uh, an author couldn't afford it, but. Uh, it's always a shame when you're like that was a really good production when's the next yeah. one coming out oh it's not oh. Mm -hmm. so congratulations well, I knew, thank awesome. you yeah i mean i knew when i picked her i was like oh this is going to be quite a commitment like, it was one of those things where you know you write a book and you spend a little money on this or that or whatever but when it comes to audio it's like okay rubber meets the road here you better mm -hmm. have a lot of faith in your work and because this is this is serious now this is yeah. this is serious business so and that's what i've talked to knew. anybody who's approached me before i've been like listen it, 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 how are your sales doing now in your print or ebook version because for some for some authors it's just uh, uh oh i would just love to see my book in audio form and i had the budget for it and i may not make that back but for a lot of self-published authors um that's like you said, it's a big commitment. It's a big commitment emotionally because you're giving somebody else uh, artistic license to create your characters and scenery. Um, but it's a huge financial commitment that you may or may not make back. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, you do, and you're, yeah. you'll see you're on your way to do it. Um, I know. That's, yeah. So that's that's really good. and for me. If I if I actually do do mine, that's great for me because I'm not paying anything. To it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's so. a certain thrill to have like somebody else, like a professional, you know, narrator, yeah. read your words. How do they see your character? Exactly. How going to interpret them? Yeah. Exactly. So we have our own voices for them. We talked about it earlier. How, how they it's sound like, in our heads. It's but. like hmm, that's not how that line sounded in my head, but hmm, that's good. <laughs> Better. Yeah. It's kind of scary too. Uh, honestly, yeah, it was a little bit of, you know, letting go there because, I mean, I, I don't have any control over how anyone interprets my book, whether they're reading it or listening to it on audio. I mean, an audio book is just, you're, you're, I don't want to say forced, but you're forced into somebody else's interpretation of the words, which, which is fine. That's why you listen to audiobooks. Uh, um, but yeah, I don't have any control over how readers, you know, see my characters or, or, you know, interpret the line that I wrote. Um, so I was like, there's, it's no different um, than true. that. So I don't have any control over that. And I don't have a problem with anybody's interpretation. It's their interpretation. It, it's like when you buy the book, it's yours. <laughs> it's sure. not my book anymore. It's your book. Read it yeah. however you want, interpret it however you want. 
I think it's really important. I think it's really important for you as the author. If you do have, I think it's a, I think it's a great resource for the original author. Like, let's say you're listening to your book being read back to you. It's a great way for you to be all like, okay, that's how it sounded or came across. And maybe it's not what you intended. It's a great way to be like, how can I improve my storytelling for future projects? Yes, it's funny because there were a few lines and and I was like, that is definitely not how I thought that was gonna come across. I mean, I thought I was being clear by the context, you know, uh, but uh, now I have sort of like another aspect of writing where in my head, I'm like, okay, how is it, how will that be read if I don't say, you know, this? So uh, I try to be more specific now, which only helps my writing because then, you know, uh, I'm almost becoming a director now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, as far as how people are going to interpret. That's um, kind of what being an words. author is. Yeah. Being a director of these characters, you know? Yeah, but sometimes it can get a little overwhelming if you do if you if you're writing too many action beats and you're just not letting the dialogue, um, you know, if there's dialogue tags where you're saying you know like he said angrily or whatever you know at some point read the room, we know he's angry you don't have to you know, you know. No, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. I hate you. He said joyfully. Like, no, <laughs> wait. Yeah. We talked about that. Your your third book is hopefully by the end of the summer, you know, maybe, maybe not here. And you said you have a fourth book in the making. I do. Is the fourth book the end of this series? Um, and or my little tag on question here, because maybe you want to explore other stories in general or other time periods, other, you, you said you, you, you love the forties, love that era. Do you have any desire to write any other decade or take these existing characters into the future? Um. The fourth book is the last in the original planned. Um, like everything that has started in this will resolve by the fourth um, book. That being said, those characters are still having scenes in my head and I'm still writing them down. Um, and so they definitely do still have a future in my head. <laughs> um, and I do have plans uh, for one book that would like there would be a fifth and then there would be a sixth and uh, I don't see anything past the sixth book that being said I haven't come up with that I mean because they did so much growing and you know coming into their own in in this first series you know I don't want to write more books about them just to have them do stuff they still need to learn and they need to grow and, and, and things like that. I don't just want to have things happen to them because, you know, in the world that they live, there's tons of stuff that could happen to them, but I need them to grow and, and move. And I haven't, I haven't found that thing yet. So I, I just keep writing scenes as they come to me, just so they'll stop playing in my head. Cause if I don't write them down, I, I just keep replaying them. <laughs> so, so it's like true. my brain going, write it down. Like, no, you'll come back to me tomorrow. No, no, write it down. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I could go on with them. I think it was Stephen King. I can't remember how he, how he phrased it, but he has a ton, obviously, Stephen King, prolific writer. He's got a ton of stories that he's written or, you know, wrote, written outlines for, if not outright written, but he hasn't done anything with them because he's doesn't have that that background the purpose the, the 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 snare so to speak like okay these are really cool ideas or in characters or scenes but there's no reason for it to exist exactly yet. that's uh, exactly right yeah yeah um as far as am i going to continue with historical fiction i mean i know a lot about it but honestly if i want to be a writer that can make a living from my writing i would probably have to move into something like contemporary romance lesbic romance um, which I don't know. I, again, I need a reason. I need people need to grow and, and stuff like that, which, you know, it's no different than historical fiction, but, you know, like we were talking about World War II being just so dramatic, you know, it's like, I just can't, I haven't gotten out of that, you know, overwhelmingly dramatic world. 
uh, in contemporary romance just doesn't, I mean, yes, the world can be overly dramatic in contemporary romance as well, but um, I just haven't found the thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll give a shot at that um, when this is done, but, you know, like right now it's all consuming. And I'm so glad that this was already written because I can't imagine being creative while I'm doing all this marketing and the learning and the social media and all that, it's, it's overwhelming. So I'm happy that all I'm doing is revising and I'm not being creative. Um, and my plan was like to be creative while I was doing all this. So that by the time I'm done with the fourth book, you know, I'll put that little thing in the back of the book and we'll, we'll just move on to the next thing. But I don't think that's going to happen because I, I'm exhausted. 